Tim McCarver, Bob Gibson's longtime catcher and teammate with the St. Louis Cardinals, said of Bob, quote, For my money, the most intimidating, arrogant pitcher to ever kick up dirt on a mound is Bob Gibson, end quote. He also remarked that that intimidation came from the way he stared down from the mound, his, quote, eyes smoldering at each batter accusingly, end quote. Pitchers have to be intimidating. In a position that requires a one-on-one battle to start a play, that intensity and anger is necessity. In that moment, you want a pitcher to look mean, to strike fear in the heart of the batter, and to give the batter the idea that he has no chance to win. In the case of Bob Gibson, this meanness and intensity worked more often than not. Part of his dominance came from a quick delivery. He possessed a savage slider and two fastball variations that topped 92 to 95 miles per hour and almost triple digits on some occasions. This intensity enhanced his dominance. Born in 1935 in Omaha, Nebraska, the seventh of seven siblings, Gibson did not have a father in his life due to his death before Bob's birth. He would rely heavily on the oldest of the Gibson children, Josh. As a two-sport star, he excelled in both baseball and basketball. And after high school, he was offered a contract to play for the St. Louis Cardinals. However, his brother had, had advised him to go to college. Josh was able to secure him a basketball scholarship for Creighton University. While at Creighton, Gibson further honed his athletic prowess. Not only did he set the all-time Creighton basketball record for points per game, but was third all-time in school history in total points. And Creighton basketball retired his number 45. However, it was baseball that got the attention of the scouts. He was capable of playing multiple positions and led the Nebraska College Conference with a 333 average and posted a 6-2 record as a pitcher. For his efforts, the Phillies, Dodgers, Yankees, White Sox, and A's all offered him baseball contracts. His basketball contracts came from the Minneapolis Lakers and in a fun twist, the Harlem Globetrotters, the barnstorming, fun show team that would travel the country and entertain fans. Seemingly, he wanted to play for the Cardinals, though. He ended up taking the Harlem Globetrotters deal and played with them for four months. Then the Cardinals came back with a minor league offer. He debuted for the Cardinals during the 1959 season after a two-year stint in the minors and pitched 75.2 innings going 3-5. and five. Gibson would go on to split the 1960 season between the Cardinals AAA affiliate and the majors. But after 1961, he would not look back and was with the Cardinals for the next 14 seasons. In 62, he achieved his first of nine All-Star appearances, winning 15 games and racking up 208 strikeouts. Going into the 1963 season, Bob Gibson was establishing himself as one of the best young pitchers in the game and was also becoming a key player for the Cardinals in their push for a World Series. That would come the next season when Gibson went 9-2 down the stretch to finish the season. In the World Series, he pitched three games, including a critical Game 5 appearance, but it was Game 7 when the Cards called on their ace once more. Gibson worked fast, as he always did, to try and hide his fatigue. The game went to the Cardinals, and Gibson secured his first World Series MVP award. In 65, he would go on to win the first of nine straight gold gloves, showing his defensive prowess on the mound. It was also his first 20-win season, in addition to 270 strikeouts. Gibson would again win another World Series in 1967 and in the process take the World Series MVP. However, 1968 would see his most successful season in the majors and set off a stretch of dominance that is remarkable to say the least. In 68, he won 22 games and had a blistering 1.12 ERA, winning the Cy Young Award as well as the NL MVP, and guided the Cardinals to another World Series appearance. Unfortunately, the Cardinals would lose this series. Despite the Cardinals' loss, his performance in Game 1 stands out as one of the greatest playoff performances of all time. He struck out 17, walked one, and threw a shutout. His 17 Ks stand today as the most strikeouts in a playoff game, and in my opinion, a record that will remain untouched, especially in the current era of playoff baseball when specialization and bullpen work become more prevalent in the postseason. 
After this season, the pitching mound was lower due to the current domination of pitching in the game. Gibson played a role in this ridiculously entertaining era of pitching that saw historic lows in scoring. 1970 would see him win his second Cy Young, and in 1971, he threw a no-hitter against the Pittsburgh Pirates. Sadly, as most athletes discover, health becomes a major factor, and injuries begin to take their toll, as did for one of the most feared pitchers of all time. He retired in 1975. When all was said and done, Gibson finished with two Cy Youngs, one MVP, two World Series MVPs, nine gold gloves, and was a nine-time All-Star. For his career, he posted a sub-3 ERA, 251 wins, and a crazy 3,115 strikeouts. Good for 16th all-time. Many players that played for and against Gibson have remarked at his tenacity as and intensity as stated before. This intimidating presence produced some of the greatest pitching performances of all time, and some consider his 1968 campaign as the single most dominant season for a pitcher in the history of baseball. He was elected to the Hall of Fame at Cooperstown in 1981 and was a member of the All-Century team in 1999. In a previous video, I profiled Satchel Paige. These two are very comparable and can easily be thought of as some of the most dominant pitchers of their respective eras. Unfortunately for Paige, the vast majority of his career was spent in barnstorming leagues, the Caribbean, the Dominican Republic, and the Negro Leagues, where the reliability of validated stats is questionable. Gibson stepped into the major leagues just as it was undergoing massive changes due to desegregation, and we are lucky he was able to pitch in the majors and be counted among the greats. Thank you for watching this episode from Everything Has History. If you liked it, please share it and subscribe to my channel. And I'll see you on the next episode from Everything Has History. Mm -hmm.